clear? Yes, please. It's okay. Thank you very much. So uh, it is my pleasure today to introduce the second speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Ala Ishiwi. She is one of uh, of very brilliant uh, clinical pharmacists at Urology and Nephrology Center. We are proud of uh, her and her activities. And I know uh, some of the attendees in this Zoom meeting uh, knew her well because she participated with us in the Zoom for this is the third time for the Zoom activities. And uh, here today, we, she will be in a very uh, big challenge because we have two eminent professors who are interested in nutritional therapies. Professor Umay Masalah, senior professor of uh, nutritional therapy, and she is interested in this issue. And as I mentioned in the beginning, she established a degree uh, with the Germany, uh, with German school. And uh, Professor Iman Sarhan, professor of uh, internal medicine and nephrology at the Ain Shams University. Uh, Dr. Ala will speak about total parental nutrition at large, and then she will specify in some points renal touch with total parental nutrition, and after her presentation, I'm expecting a whole discussion. Dr. Ala. Uh, in the beginning, I would like to thank Dr. Hussein for always giving the clinical pharmacist a platform and always advocating for us. So today, my talk will be about total parenteral nutrition with a special focus on renal patients. I will focus on how to measure or how to calculate and how to efficiently prescribe a TBN. So malnutrition at present is still a common problem in hospitalized patients, and it affects nearly 20 to 50 percent of the inpatients, with the consequences of increased mortality and increased of uh, length of hospital stay, and also increased of the treatment cost. So in order to avoid all these consequences, we have to optimize the nutrition through first efficient screening of nutritional condition, and also effective calculation of energy and nutrient requirements, and also decide which route of administration that these nutrients will be delivered through. Through and also tight monitoring and competent complication management. So going through the first point, which is screening of nutritional status, we can do it by both scores and biochemical parameters. Now, if you search, you will find hundreds of questionnaires that you can use to screen for patients at nutritional risk. But in 2018, the ESPEN guidelines came up with something called GLIM criteria. Uh, this criteria summarizes all the available questionnaires, and it's based on three phenotypic criteria, and uh, which is uh, weight loss and body mass index and measurement of muscle mass, and two etiological criteria regarding food intake and disease burden and inflammation. It also classifies the malnutrition into two stages, stage one, which is moderate, and stage two, which is severe. The patient must demonstrate at least one phenotypic criteria and one etiological criteria for it to be diagnosed with malnutrition. Also, we can use biochemical parameters, but the current trend in practice nowadays is to use albumin as a surrogate marker for uh, malnutrition. This trend, however, is not entirely true because albumin is not sensitive to near or recent malnutrition due to its long half-life, but we have to measure it because it is a predictor of mortality. However, the uh, parameters that are more sensitive to recent malnutrition are pre-albumin and retinol binding proteins. So we have established that the patient is uh, malnourished or nutritionally at risk. So we have to start a nutritional care plan. But the question arises, do we start intral or parenteral? So there is a golden rule in nutrition that says, if the gut works, use it. So any condition that warrants the use of the GI tract is an absolute indication of parenteral nutrition. This could be intestinal failure 
or insufficient internal and oral feeding. And here, the timing is very crucial. So for instance, if I have a well-nourished patient, but he is hospitalized for seven days and he's unable to maintain at least 50% of his uh, caloric requirements through the oral route, by day eight, I have to start the TBN. And also, if the patient is nutritionally at risk and he's expected in the coming five days of not being able to establish desired oral intake, by day three, I have to start the TBN. And if the patient is diagnosed based on the GLIM criteria to be moderate or severely malnourished, I have to start the TBN as soon as possible. So the contraindication, on the other hand, is hemodynamic instability. As we all know, a stable microhemodynamic situation is very important to be able to utilize nutrients. So if the patient suffers from shock or serum lactate above three or hypoxic or severe acidotic, the patient must not receive any form of nutrition, whether it was enteral or parenteral. Also, if the patient suffers from electrolyte imbalances, we uh, do not initiate the parenteral nutrition. We have to correct it first and then start the nutrition. This could be hyperglycemia if the blood glucose is above 300 due to the uh, high uh, glucose load of the TBN or azotemia or hyperosmolarity or hypokalemia or hypophosphatemia. So after we have established that the patient will receive TBN, we must know what are the basics of a TBN. So a successful and efficient TBN must be composed of the following. Carbohydrates, protein, and lipids, which will form the macronutrients, vitamins, trace elements, and electrolytes, which will represent the micronutrients. Now, speaking first about the carbohydrate, which will be the major source of energy, uh, one gram of dextrose will yield 3.4 kcal. It's very important to know that. Glucose in concentrations above than 10% will be given through the uh, central line. And also, we have to make a stepwise increase in order to allow for the endogenous insulin to be released and also to prevent the osmotic diarrhea effect of the glucose. Also, glucose represents 70% uh, of the non-protein calories. Now, there is a limit when it comes to there is a limit when it comes to the, uh, the glucose infusion rate, which is 5 milligrams per kg per minute. That line we should not cross because if we cross it, the patient will suffer from fatty liver and hyperglycemia. This is what's called the oxidation threshold of glucose. If we give the patient more glucose above that rate, the, uh, the excess glucose will be turned into fat. So after we calculate our uh, TBN, we have to measure the GIR using this calculation or using mobile application. The second component is amino acids. Amino acids will be source of energy as well as source of proteins for uh, enzymatic activity. Now, as we know, proteins is not friend to the kidneys. So the renal patients will have a special requirements regarding the amino acids. For the CKD patients, we prefer protein restriction up to 0.6 grams per kg per day. These requirements can be increased if he undergoes hemodialysis since the dialysis process removes the protein. For ICU patients, due to their hypercatabolic state, we increase the requirement up to 1.5 grams per kg per day. And for the obese patient, we have to make sure that these requirements are adjusted according to their ideal body weight. So it can increase up to 2.5 grams per kg. For the AKI, the NICE guidelines came up with these recommendations. They classified the patient into two categories, catabolic and non-catabolic AKI. For the non-catabolic part, uh, they say that uh, those are the patients suffering from AKI due to pre-renal or post-renal causes. Uh, post-renal causes, and they prefer protein restriction up to one grams per kg per day. For the catabolic part, uh, which is AKI due to sepsis or burns, have to uh, compensate for the losses of this protein because we do not want to start what's called protein energy wasting syndrome, which is fatal and is associated with higher mortality and an increased length of hospital stay. 
So in uh, catabolic AKI patients undergoing, for instance, uh, chronic uh, CRRT, the protein can be increased up to 2.5 grams per kg per day. After I have calculated my protein, I have to well, make actually, sure please now. Please share the screen, please. Please reach the screen, please. Reshare the screen. Reshare your screen again. Okay. Okay, is it clear now? Yes, yes, it's clear. Please uh, revise the previous slide. Uh, this one? You can return back to the previous one. No, the, the previous one again. This one? The ICU, the the ICU? Of, oh. uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So uh, for the ICU patient, due to the hypercatabolic state, we increase the protein requirements up to 1.5 grams per kg. For the obese patient, uh, for instance, we have to adjust the protein requirements according to the ideal body weight. And this is very important point, not all, all requirements, we do not choose the actual body weight for the obese patients. We always go for the ideal body weight because we do not want to add to their obesity. We just want to give them enough calories to maintain their vital functions. So if the patient has a body mass index above 40, the requirement will be more than 2.5 grams per kg ideal body weight. For the AKI, on the other hand, the NICE guidelines made uh, the following recommendations. They have classified the patients into two categories, catabolic and non-catabolic. The non-catabolic part are the AKIs due to pre-renal and post-renal causes, and they prefer protein restriction in those population, and the proteins can be given up to only a one gram per kg per day. But uh, the patients suffering from AKI related to sepsis or burns and associated with multiple organ damage, they will be catabolic and there will be a negative nitrogen balance. So the protein requirements will be increased to compensate this and to prevent the formation of protein energy wasting syndrome, which is fatal and associated with increased mortality. So catabolic AKI patients uh, will increase the protein requirements and if they are undergoing continuous renal replacement therapy, the proteins will be up to 2.5 grams per kg per day. So after I have calculated my protein requirement, I have to make sure that the patient is receiving enough nitrogen to maintain the muscle mass and to prevent the muscle wasting. So I have to calculate something called non-protein calories to nitrogen ratio. This ratio is, is specific according to the disease state of the patient. For instance, if he is severely stressed, the ratio must be around 80 to 1. If he's critically ill and has a low muscle mass, it must be around 100 to 1. For stable patients, we increase it to 200. And in uremic patients, we increase it up to 400 to 1. Uh, when it comes to glutamine, glutamine is an amino acid and it's presented commercially under the brand name Dibeptivan. Uh, now, glutamine becomes essential in critically ill patients, and it's responsible for maintaining the integrity of the bowel mucosa. And the current trend nowadays, especially in post-orbitive patients receiving TBN, is to administer glutamine, thinking that it will prevent the mucosal atrophy. But in 2019, the ESBEN guidelines made a clear recommendation of against using glutamine in renal failure because it's associated with increased mortality and no added benefit to the patient. The third component of the TBN is the lipids. Now, the lipids are mainly used as a source of energy and also to decrease the glucose uh, load. And also it's used to prevent something called essential fatty acid deficiency syndrome. Uh, the lipids will constitute of 30% of the non-protein calories, and we have to make sure that the available lipid in our hospital contains linoleic acid and contains uh, omega-3. 
for the commercially available ones here in Egypt under the concentration of 10%, will provide 550 kikal, and the 20% will provide 1,000 kikal. There's also a limit in renal patients that we should not cross, which is one gram per kg per day. The infusion rate, on the other hand, is very important also not to cross, which is 0.11 grams per kg per hour, because if I increase the infusion, the patient will start suffering from reactions and the triglycerides will be elevated to the sky roof. And also there is a criteria to hold the IV fat emulsion uh, administration, which is if the triglyceride at any point exceeds 400, we have to stop the infusion. If the patient is hemodynamically unstable, we have to stop it. And also if I know that the patient has allergies to egg, fish or soybean, we do not administer the fat. But say for instance, my patient is starting this fat uh, uh, infusion for the first time, and I'm not sure if he's gonna tolerate it or not, I can make something called test dose. Now the test dose is, uh, if I'm using the 10%, I will infuse it at a rate of one milli per minute for 15 minutes. If the patient does not uh, develop reactions, like he's not feverish, there's no chill, there is no rash, he's not complaining of chest tightness or nausea or vomiting, I can proceed and I increase the rate up to 80 to 100 millis. Or I can base the tolerance based on the serum triglyceride level. At first, I determine the, uh, the baseline serum triglyceride level and then start the infusion. And after the infusion has terminated uh, by eight hours, I will re-measure the serum triglyceride. If at any point the serum triglyceride was more than 250, the rate should be reduced. Also, it's very important to know that uh, lipid infusion time should not exceed 12 hours. This is the recommended time according to the CDC because if we exceed 12 hours infusion time, uh, bacteria will evolve and it could be a source of infection. Also, when it comes to propofol, for patients maintained on propofol infusion and also receiving TBN containing lipid are more prone to something called overfeeding. Why is that? Because propofol is considered as a lipid emulsion and he provides calories as a 10% lipid emulsion. So if I'm not including propofol in my calculation, the patient will suffer from overfeeding, which will result in hyperglycemia, fatty liver, hypertriglyceridemia, and excess CO2 uh, production, especially in ventilated patients. So if the following criteria are met, propofol must be included in my calculation. If the patient uh, have feeds at final goals and also if the propofol is provided as an hourly infusion, has been inf infused for the previous 24 hours and expected to continue for additional 24 hours and if the propofol average hourly infusion weight is more than 20 milli per hour. So if these, all these criteria are present, I have to include propofol in my calculations. Also, uh, the second part is when, uh, now we have established uh, the macronutrients, we have talked about it. So let us now know how do we start giving the patient these nutrients? Do we start at gold or not? For protein, it's very important to start at goal from day one because most of these patients will be catabolic and they will suffer from muscle, muscle wasting. So we have to start proteins at goals from the day one. When it comes to carbs and lipid, no, we have to start slow and advance accordingly because if I started with full caloric feeding from day one, the patient will suffer from a refeeding syndrome, which is fatal. So for instance, for carbohydrate, I can start with a GIR of two and a half and advance by one until I reach my goal, which it should be less than five, which is the limit as we have established. For the lipid, also I start slow and advance accordingly. For the micronutrients, uh, the protein, uh, the vitamins and the trace elements become essential in critical ill patients. So we have to administer these, uh, we have to administer it. I'm sorry, I think I'm experiencing technical problems when it comes to the 
pictures in my slide, but it's okay. The, the slide here showed that uh, the daily requirement of proteins in a patient's receiving TBN is doubled those with uh, is doubled those with the, the patients uh, with the normal adult patients so uh, so sorry. excuse me uh, could you just excuse me until we fix it The slides should show that uh, the, micro, uh, the micronutrients, which is vitamins and trace elements, is present commercially uh, in, uh, in a drug called Vitalibit, which contains the fat-soluble vitamins, and smooth uh, and solubate, which contains the water-soluble vitamins. So the doses uh, should be one ampoule, which is compatible with the TBN, and it's added to the TBN. We should just make sure that the amount of vitamin C available in these ampoules should not exceed 250 milligrams per day because uh, if we cross that limit, oxalate will start to form and this is something we don't want in our renal patients. Uh, and also the trace elements becomes essential, especially selenium for the patients undergoing hemodialysis. So we can add one ampoule of Adamil. So uh, the fluid requirement, this is also a table that should represent the fluid requirement. However, it's very important after I've done all my calculations is to make sure that the volume of the TBN is not exceeding the fluid requirement of the patient, especially in renal patients because the physician could request a fluid restriction. So the number one complication of the TBN is fluid overload. So after I've done my calculation, I sum all the uh, uh, bottles added to the patient and see if I'm giving him too much so I can reduce the fluid and avoid uh, fluid overload. So the, uh, the third part of this presentation is how to order your TBN. Now, ordering should follow the following steps and you have to stick to the orders of it. So first you have to determine the fluid volume and then determine the caloric needs and then the protein requirements, then fat and carbs. Now, how do we estimate the caloric requirements of the patient? There is three methods, which is indirect calorimetry, which is the best method, especially in critically ill patients. However, this method is not available here in Egypt. There's also predictive equations like Harris-Benedict equation, but the ESBN guidelines do not prefer it, and they say that these equations are inaccurate. But uh, the last one, which is the weight-based equations, is the most simple one, and it's the one that we're going to use and follow. Of course, the weight-based equations will be based according to the disease state of the patient. So in AKI patients, we go around 20 to 30 kcals per kg. We could increase it up to 35 in case of CRRT. For a CKD patient, it's going to be around 30. For ICU patient in the acute phase, we prefer giving low calories, and in the recovery phase, we can increase it up to 30. On the obese patients, however, in the RCU, we prefer hypocaloric feeding. As I've mentioned before, we do not want to add to their obesity. We just want to give enough calories to maintain uh, sufficient uh, vital functions. So if we adjust it according to the ideal body weight, it will be 25 kcal per kg. Uh, this is an example. Uh, this is a case that we have been encountered here at UNC. Uh, it is for a 45-year-old patient presented with AKI secondary to sepsis. He, he underwent hemodialysis. His weight was 70, body mass index was low, and uh, the patient did not eat for a, week, uh, for a week, and when we is, uh, have done the GLAM criteria, it was diagnosed with moderate uh, malnutrition. So a TBN order must be done immediately. So how do we calculate it? First, we estimate the total caloric requirements as 30 kcal, and then we determine the fluid requirements for him. The first thing we uh, estimate is the protein needs. We choose, of course, the 1.5 grams because this patient is catabolic, and we want to give him enough 
proteins. So using the commercially available 10% uh, amino acid solution, the patient required around two bottles. For the, when we, uh, now we calculated the protein needs, now we need to calculate the calories that comes from fat and carbohydrate. So by subtracting the energy from the protein, we, uh, we have 1,680 uh, 1, kcals, which will be divided 30% as, uh, as uh, fat and 70% as carbohydrate. Using the 20% lipid emulsion, the patient will require half a bottle. And when we calculate using 25% dextrose, the patient will require around three bottles. Of course, as after we have done calculations with the dextrose, we have to calculate the GIR, as I've mentioned before, to make sure that I'm not crossing my limit and I'm not endangering the patient with hyperglycemia. So by doing the math, it is 3.4 milligrams per kg, which is unaccepted. And also we calculate the final volume, as I've mentioned before, because the doctor does not want fluid overload, of course. So after doing the math, it is 150 millis excess. It's accepted since the patient undergoes hemodialysis. Also, we have to measure the non-protein to nitrogen ratio to make sure that he is receiving enough nitrogen content to maintain his muscle mass. And the ratio came, by doing the math, came around 100 to 1, which is accepted range for stressed patients. The fourth uh, thing that we're going to talk about is administration considerations. Now, of course, uh, TBN can be administered through peripheral line or central line, but we prefer central line, especially in the following conditions. If the patient is expected to have a nutritional support for more than 14 days, and if he's needing hyperosmolar solutions exceeding 850 milliosmoles per liter, and also, of course, if he's requiring glucose at concentrations above 25%, and the patient is maintained on fluid restriction. The second thing that we need to discuss is the infusion time. Do we infuse the TBN over 24 hours or 10 to 14 hours? Now, the continuous route is preferred and it's well, well tolerated by most patients. It requires less manipulation and decreased nursing time and also decrease of touch of contamination. You just hang the TBN and just leave it. However, the cyclic is more preferred for patients receiving TBN at home. It is infused over 10 to 14 hours, but it is contraindicated in hospitalized patients, especially critically ill and mechanically ventilated patients. So we always go for the infusion for 24 hours. So on a daily basis, we have to check the readiness of the patient to receive oral nutrition. We do not prefer parenteral nutrition, of course, because long time TBN is associated with multiple complications and multiple yeah, bad things that could come from the TBN. So on a daily basis, I start to give the patient trophic enteral feeding. So I start by giving him 10 to, 10, 10 to 20 milli per hour of the enteral nutrition. If the patient tolerates it, he's not developing nausea or vomiting, he's not developing nausea or vomiting, or he's not uh, complaining of abdominal pain, I can proceed the next day and increase it up to 40 milli. And I can do so until the patient reaches 50%, uh, more than 60% of his caloric intake through the oral route. If this is uh, established and achieved, I can stop the TBN and continue on the oral route. Now, do we abruptly discontinue the TBN or not? The answer is no. We taper the TBN to avoid what's called rebound hypoglycemia. So in order to discontinue it, uh, the infusion rate should be halved for the first hour and then halved again for the next hour and then discontinue it. After 30 minutes, I have to monitor the blood glucose level uh, to uh, avoid the uh, formation of hypoglycemia. The second question is compatibility of the drugs with the TBN. Now, of course, we prefer not adding drugs to the TBN. Uh, this is completely wrong, except for regular insulin and uh, ranitidine if it's used for stress ulcer prophylaxis. But in practice, it's sometimes required to give 
the drugs, uh, especially in patients suffering from poor peripheral veins. So we could check what's called uh, TBN Y site compatibility. You can consult the clinical pharmacist available. And this chart demonstrates the drugs that are compatible when given in Y site with TBN infusion. Now, the monitoring is very important. Uh, we have to monitor the electrolytes and the blood glucose. And the monitoring is at increased rate, especially in the acute phase. And also, we have to make a clinical examination to check if the patient is suffering from fluid overload or dehydration. The nurse, on the other hand, must check the perinatal nutrition bag all the time to check if there is no physical discoloration or physical pre uh, precipitation. Also, the doctor must make sure that the patient is receiving adequate delivery of the diet and also check the readiness to introduce enteral nutrition on a daily basis. Now, the complication of TBN, there are so many complications, especially related to long-term administration of the TBN, could be mechanical uh, related to the catheter insertions or metabolic or, of course, fluid overload and infection. But I'm going to concentrate more on the most common complication, which is hyperglycemia. Now, uh, hyperglycemia is uh, common and is very seen, especially if the GIR uh, of the patient is more than five milligrams per kg per, uh, per minute. Uh, so whenever I start my enteral or parenteral nutrition, I have to know the basal glucose of the patient. If my patient is a diabetic and he is an insulin, I have to add insulin to his TBN bag. So I will add one unit of regular insulin to each 10 grams of dextrose administered. If before initiating the TBN, the fasting blood glucose level of this patient was constantly above 200, I increase the units up to two units of regular insulin in the TBN. Of course, for critically ill patients, we prefer continuous insulin infusion. I monitor the blood glucose level every four to six hours, and my goal is to maintain it between 140 to 180. If the patient at any reading exceeds 180, the first thing I do is to reduce the load of glucose up to 150 per day. And also, I can start insulin therapy. I could mix short-acting insulin with the parenteral nutrition using the ratio 10 unit for each 150 grams, or I could add basal subcutaneous insulin, or I could add short-acting insulin or long-acting insulin. And always, I have to maintain the target between 140 and 180. The second complication is refeeding syndrome, which is a fatal complication that occurs due to too rapid feeding uh, of the patient. Most of these patients are starved for a period more than a week, and those patients are in catabolic state. Uh, so when I introduce refeeding, the patient switch to anabolism and occurs a fatal switch of fluid and nutrients, which will result in hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, hypophosphatemia, vitamin B1 deficiency, and salt and water retention. The clinical manifestation on the patient will be cardiac arrhythmias and volume overload. So in order to avoid with this, we have to identify the patients at risk. The NICE guidelines came up with these criteria. If the patient, these criteria are based on the body mass index and uh, measurement of the weight losses, and also obtaining a good history from, from the patient and to know when he stopped eating, and also to measure the potassium and phosphorus uh, levels before initiating the TBN. If my patient is identified as a risk patient, we have a different approach in giving him the TBN. We give him very low calories on day one. We start by 10 kcal per kg per day. And if his blood mass index is below 14 or hasn't been eating for 15 days, we reduce it up to 5 kcal per kg per day. We have to make sure that the carbohydrates uh, uh, percentages is 50% and we increase the protein and fat ones. Also, we have to give them prophylactic supplementation of phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, and sodium. We have to give him IV thiamine, uh, 200 or 300 milligrams 
times stat and giving vitamin B complex 30 minutes before feeding. And also we have to maintain zero fluid balance and monitor the biochemistry daily. On the coming days from day two to day four, we increase the caloric intake gradually and slowly by 5 kcal per kg. And also monitor the biochemistry and continue giving the IV thiamine 100 milligrams and vitamin B complex. By day five or seven, the patient should reach his full caloric intake and also continue on monitoring his biochemistry. If at any point the patient starts to develop refeeding syndrome, maybe because I wasn't able to early identify him, I have to stop the feeding and start correct the imbalances and excuse me on this slide, technical problems. So at last, as Hippocrates said, in all malate, those who are well nourished do best. It's very bad to be thin and wasted. So my key message here is that nutrition is very important in the fast progression of the patient. We should not neglect it. We should initiate it as soon as possible because the patients will benefit from it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ala, for this very nice pleasant excellent presentation i like it thank you i'm very proud of you thank you Dr. I proud by, of dr russia so your presentation is excellent and it touched a critical issue in general and you try to put the nephrology in the in touch with total parental nutrition here in our center we have experience with the, dealing with patients to, in the urology department who suffered from uh, uh, cancer and the, the status of uh, cancer treatment and operation is stated long fasting. So uh, as you mentioned, if uh, uh, the operation is stated uh, fasting more than five days, after five days we start to tip in. Yes. And the master statement you said uh, to avoid refeeding syndrome is start gradual and to end when the, everything is coming good is to end gradually as well. And, and the refeeding syndrome is very important to the extent that uh, uh, two years ago we put it uh, a case in the electrolyte assessment for MD nephrology candidates. Regarding TBN in nephrology and in dialysis, um, uh, as you know, my master degree since 1994, I was working in nutrition in hemodialysis, and I was believing in internal nutrition, not parental nutrition. And all literature from that date up to date uh, confirming the same. TBN, intradialytic parental nutrition, doesn't add to the patient outcome. But as you mentioned, if the gut uh, is failing, if there is severe malnutrition, that oral and intral uh, uh, supplements uh, witness the failure, we should give intradialytic parental nutrition even if we give the patient amino acid infusion during the dialysis session. Yes. Last year, 19, uh, 2019, there is a very nice guidelines came from British Renal Association that is valid up to 2024, uh, discussing dietary recommendations for CKD patients and included a statement for parental nutrition that parental nutrition should be kept at the end, the last resort after failure of oral and enteral. And the evidence of this recommendation is just 2D. It is very weak evidence because there is no sure that giving intradialytic parental nutrition will solve the problem. The most important thing is to avoid malnutrition as we can. Thank you very much. And the, the, uh, the, your talk is open for discussion. And we will start with the moderators, Professor Umay Masalah and then Professor Iman Sarhan. Umayma? Motasim. Please unmute yourself, Dr. Umayma. Thank you very much, dear Ala, for this uh, very uh, elegant presentation, actually. Uh, although you, you were uh, a bit on a hurry because Dr. Hussain arranged for too long <laughs> lectures. <laughs> 
uh, uh, but actually uh, it's it's very nice and uh, uh, and uh, and uh, well presented uh, actually dr hussein i was very interested in refeeding syndrome and uh, and i was uh, teaching uh, uh, about 10 years ago for our md staff i gave i i started to talk uh, about, to talk about it for them, uh, to them, uh, if, because uh, it, it has to be kept on mind in ICU cases and in any uh, cases with severe uh, malnutrition, starting uh, feeding or starting any. Uh, or nowadays we are um, supposed to have it to to see it also in uh, cases on keto diet if they decide suddenly. To, to, to start uh, normal feeding because they are already shifted their metabolism to the uh, fatty acid metabolism. And when they start uh, uh, having sugar or having uh, carbohydrate, they will uh, go to a state of refeeding syndrome. But actually, I think they give, give them supplements for that. Um, uh, uh, I uh, actually in your presentation, my dear, you said ranitidine, but I think you, we don't use ranitidine nowadays in the infusion because it is um, it, it is uh, not used or used because uh, some uh, something else is the the guideline the Aspen guidelines talk, uh, to, about uh, glutamine that it is not used. But entrally, of, of course, it is used entrally in cases mm -hmm. of birth. Uh, what about the thiamine? Do, where do you find it? Available? Commercially, the thiamine is not available. It's present in, uh, in vitamin B complex ampoules. Unfortunately, ah, it's not. Yes. Become, um, ah. yeah. When you're doing your uh, 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 Rubin or neurotone or something, but but you cannot use it uh, intramuscular. Intra, yes. Yeah, it become is uh, on. You are giving the patient uh, anticoagulation, so you yes. are afraid of giving any intramuscular. Uh, uh, thank of you very course. much, my. Thank team. you so much. Thank, thank you very much, Mama. You touched a very important issue. Uh, we are accustomed to give the patient vitamin B because they are water soluble, and so mm. they are dialyzable. So yes. we give it an infusion when they were available in parenteral form. And I like the intravenous, not intramuscular. I don't like intramuscular route for yes. dialysis patient anymore. The guidelines of British Renal Association that uh, released last year documented if the dialysis ex is extended like those who are dialyzed for f five hours, six hours, or over the night, they should be given uh, uh, water soluble vitamins, yes. but uh, there is no no consensus or no convincing data to to give other parameter. Yes, stress element deficiency were associated with oh. poor outcome dialysis patient, but we don't recommend giving them routinely for our patients except oh. yes. the documented deficiency. Yes. Uh, regarding uh, the vitamin C, Dr. Hassan, uh, in, in, in kidney patients, in, in, we don't like in high dose, yes. but, uh, but in sepsis patients, uh, in patients with uh, septic shock, they, it's, it's allowed in larger doses. Yeah. Uh, we, don't like vitamin, we don't like vitamin C, except if there is uh, uh, scurvy or vitamin C deficiency, because yes. we consumed by, uh, vitamin C is available in any diet. Mm -hmm. Number two, mainly to acidosis, especially in patients with uh, kidney problems. How so we don't, do we don't do like, uh, we don't like vitamin C supplementation how often in general. How need parental nutrition in, uh, oh. in your patients? Because the internal nutrition, of course, it is, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's recommended, it's highly recommended. Uh, before uh, more than uh, parental nutrition and uh, uh, by the way uh, what about the vitamin d dosage uh, of course we need to uh, uh, measure the vitamin d uh, if it is lower than 12.5 it needs to be supplemented, supplemented. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I agree yes. with you professor Romaima, but uh, i think dr ala was restricted to total parental nutrition 
Yes. And uh, the vitamin D is a big issue. And we have Professor Riyad Saeed, who is very interested in uh, ah, vitamin D. Oh, okay. But, and I'm leaving the vitamin D to him. To, for for him. His, from his, okay. But you reminded me, Professor Umayma, by metformin induced vitamin B12 deficiency. Yes. If we have a patient on metformin for chronic use, and then the patient comes manifested with some neuropathic we should think of vitamin Actually, B12. We, we have to think about it, and it's in the guidelines nowadays. Yes. The ADA put it in the, in the point of care guidelines, their recent uh, uh, diabetes care uh, by the ADA, they recommend yes. searching, uh, uh, testing vitamin B12 okay. in those yes. patients. But to be careful, because abusing vitamin B12 can be associated with problems with acute kidney injury in some patients. But in patients with metformin, uh, to be, uh, yes. to be uh, considering the vitamin B12 uh, supplementation. That's why we usually we tell the patient don't take inject uh, uh, try B injection also. But in this case, the injection could be uh, useful. Okay. Okay. Thank you all very much, Professor Omaima. You're Professor Iman Sarhan, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Iman? You have Professor Iman or she left? I don't see here, uh, Dr. Hussein. I think uh, he's. Dr. Tarek Tantawi? Is uh, one of, uh, uh, really, uh, I'm enjoyed for, for two presentations uh, with different aspects, uh, and it was a uh, clear clusters for all. And I think all we uh, we got a lot of benefit from uh, seeing this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tar. I'm really pleased. I am happy today because uh, this is a successful Zoom meeting. Dr. Yasser Mullah. Yes, Many thanks, Professor Shaisha. Uh, an excellent talk. And, and sadly, I did miss the first part because I was in the Jum'ah prayer because of the different in timing. Outstanding talk, nothing to add. Excellent, excellent. And just a minor request, if for a Friday timing, if you can kindly like modify it for those living outside the Arab countries, because truly this is a great series, outstanding series. I'm in the Western countries for the last nine years, and I never saw such a great series like this. So please, 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 Professor Shaisha, and with the request of all others, if the Friday one timing can be modified would in the future, please, that Dr. would be Yasser, great. Dr. Yasser, would you please send the, to my email the time scale, uh, just to, to put in mind, and I can review. You are in the UK, so I can, I, I, I can adjust the time, no problem. Thank you very uh, much. Outstanding talks. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Yabbe. It was very elegant lecture from Dr. Ala as usual, actually. Uh, being as a nephrologist, I cannot forget to two things, no. She mentioned, number one, uh, I think most of the TBN uh, formula is deficient in uh, phosphorus. I want to know from here how to supplement this phosphorus, number one. Uh, number two, uh, regarding the AKI induced by this uh, defeating syndrome, I think due to severe hypokalemia and hypophosphatemia can lead to rapid myolysis and the AKI. So we should put in mind this one. And third one, she mentioned uh, propofol uh, calculation. I mean, those calculation. Uh, I think if this increased more than 100 uh, uh, mic per kg per minute, it will lead to what's called uh, propofol infusion syndrome, which lead to rapid myolysis, acute heart failure, acute renal failure. And so we, we should put in mind this uh, as a cause of acute uh, kidney injury in critical ill patient using propofol. So thank you so much, Dr. Ala, and thanks also for Dr. Rasha before.
Vancouver match with Professor Saeed. I'm going to uh, tackle the first two points and I'm leaving Propofol to Dr. Ala. Regarding phosphate, we have the formula, potassium uh, uh, intravenous phosphate uh, like formula. Yes, glucophos. It mm -hmm. is intravenous and given a parenteral or over infusion to complement mm -hmm. and to uh, avoid hypophosphatemia because as, as nephrologists, we are aware by hyperphosphatemia, but hyperphosphatemia is also a very bad and associated with yeah. many problems, including muscle, heart, anemia, and a lot of problems. Uh, so uh, thank you for uh, considering uh, block of, uh, the phosphate and the hyperphosphatemia to be considered. So hyperphosphatemia, hypomagnesemia should be addressed. And the best way to avoid refeeding is uh, to put in mind and to monitor the patient well, and as uh, Dr. Alaa mentioned in the presentation, to start a gradual and to taper gradual. Regarding propofol, Dr. Alaa, um, I'm hearing. Uh, now, uh, the problem with, with the propofol is that it is a lipid emotion drug. So yes, as you have mentioned, it's associated with at uh, rates greater than 100, it will be associated with AKI. But today I mentioned propofol from a different perspective, which yeah. is, as a lipid emotion, it gives calories. So I have to take in consideration the calories that come from propofol. If I increased these calories, the patient will be overfed and he will suffer from uh, multiple problems like hyperglycemia and hypertriglyceridemia. So this is why we have to pay extra attention to propofol and we have to include it in our nutrition calculations. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, Professor Dr. Mustafa Ramadan. Your question, Dr. Mustafa. Thank you, Dr. Hussein. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Your question. I only just to uh, thank you and all the prestige. Hey, thank you very much. Dr. Tar Zayan. Actually, marvelous. Okay, so long uh, as there is no comment. Uh, uh, yeah, I have a comment, please. Yes, please. Yes, please. I just want to ask Dr. Rana about the interdialectic TBN. Because actually, I have maybe uh, some patients in the dialysis unit which usually uh, have malnutrition and they are old age, difficult to eating uh, in, at home. Usually, the family, they just uh, complaining of difficult swallowing and difficult eating at home. So I cannot actually maintain their life on NGT. So if there is a rule to support them during dialysis by a formula to help them for nutrition or not? I think this the question is to me, not to Dr. Ala, because she has no experience in the field of intradialytic parental nutrition. Uh, the intradialytic parental nutrition, as I mentioned, Dr. Tare was not confirmed to solve the problem of the patient. You should exhaust yourself to encourage oral or intral feeding. Either uh, if the oral fails and an esogastric tube fails, we, we can think of gastrostomy tube before giving to, uh, intradalytic parental nutrition. And uh, because if, uh, and we can give just uh, intradalytic parental nutrition a supplement, not total parental nutrition. So you should exhaust yourself to help him to have uh, oral or intral route before thinking of uh, parental nutrition. If you do your best and you feel at the end, there is a formula uh, to put in mind and the fluid, uh, and the, we take the mercy of the presence of fistula and we give because this are uh, high osmolar fluid. And uh, I think Dr. Ala mentioned this point. If we use peripheral vein, we should respect the osmolality. If we want to give for any patient total parental nutrition, central vein should be used because osmolality will exceed the capacity of peripheral veins. In the presence of fistula, we can give supplements. And my advice, if, if there is a problem, try to give him some calories by easy way, by blended food or something like that. And you can give him supplement of amino acids rather than total parental nutrition during the dialysis session. This is my opinion. Thank you, Dr. Hussain. Actually, we try to use a concentrated um, formula, which is coming like a juice, 
uh, during the sessions and you give them uh, at home. But you know, sometimes, as you see, uh, it is not helpful for the patient. So I will try the next option with the gastrostomy. I think I think with the aid of the dietitian or the nursing care, because you can find a specialized nurse in helping the patient to have some calories. So the intra route, it is it will be the perfect. The the best is to uh, allow the gut to work, especially if your patient uh, comes to you three times per week, and you would yeah. like to give concentrated fluids only four hours, and so this is a problem. So try as you can to avoid parental nutrition in hemodialysis patient. But if it is mandatory, it should be given according to the rules and to uh, subtract the amount of fluid to be added to the ultra filtration. If you suppose that you, you plan for two liters and you, you will give him uh, one and a half liter, so the ultra filtration will be three and a half liters. That's all. Thank you, Dr. Sim. Thank, Thank you very much. I think now it is two hours. Uh, I would like to thank and appreciate the presence of, uh, of all of you, my professors and your colleagues. And I'd like to thank the moderators, Professor Umay Masalih, Professor Iman Sarhan, for sharing us this very nice session. And uh, I have nothing to say except thanks, appreciating. Uh, it is, uh, for myself, it is very pleasant uh, Zoom meeting uh, from excellent presentation from Dr. Rasha Samir and Dr. Shiwi. I am very proud. Thank you and goodbye. Inshallah, I'm going to upload the, uh, the video, both presentation to the YouTube uh, tomorrow. Thank you and goodbye. Bye. Bye.